Let me ask our CIA officer, uh, were officials notified of Al Midhar and Al Hazmi's plans uh, to enter the United States? Uh, as I noted in my in my statement, um, the answer to that is no. Uh, my my, um, it's very difficult to understand what happened with that cable when it came in. I do not know exactly why it was missed. It would appear that it was missed completely. The, the, the cable arrived what date? March fifth. March fifth. What transpired transpired between January and the transmission of that cable being March? That sixty day period. Um, I, I maybe I misunderstood your question. I'm sorry. You, you, you uh, answered the question. This is a follow up. Oh, okay. Um, in January, they um, they were the Malaysia. Def uh, in January, uh, they were the focus of uh, the operational activity uh, until they left the country and um, at, for another country. Uh, I think it was at the eighth when when the sort of crowd broke up, the eighth of January, and. Uh, and then um, there was more effort to find out what they were doing next. Uh, and then they, uh, and to understand that, but I, I can't deal too much in the detail between what happened between that point and further on. Um, we had the basic visa information on Midhar, and, uh, and that wasn't passed. And the focus is still on trying to find out what they were up to. As discussed above, Donna drafted an electronic cable to the New York FBI requesting an open investigation to locate Khalid Amidar. She also called Chad, the FBI New York agent who primarily handed intelligence investigations for the bin Laden squad, to give him a heads up about the matter, and she subsequently sent the electronic cable to him. She wrote an email that she wanted to get the intelligence investigation going and that the electronic cable could not be shared with any of the agents working the Cole criminal case. Chad forwarded the electronic cable to his squad, Supervisor Jason, who nevertheless disseminated the electronic cable via email within the Bin Laden squad, including to the criminal agents assigned to the Cole investigation. Scott read the electronic cable and contacted Donna regarding it. Donna informed Scott that he was not supposed to have read the electronic cable because it contained NSA information that had not been cleared to be passed on to criminal agents, Scott being Steve Bongard, Donna being Dina Corsi. Donna told Scott that he needed to destroy his copy. Scott responded that the effort to locate Khalid Almedar should be part of the Cold criminal investigation, and he argued with Donna regarding the designation of the investigation as an intelligence matter. Donna asserted that because of the wall, criminal agents were not yet entitled to the underlying intelligence provided by the NSA, and without that predicating material, the FBI could not establish any connection between Khalid Almadar and the USS Cole criminal investigation. Scott, Donna, and the acting Osama bin Laden unit chief, Rob, then spoke via conference call. Scott argued that the investigation should be opened as a criminal investigation and that more resources and agents could be assigned to a criminal investigation by New York. He also argued that criminal investigation tools, such as grand jury subpoenas, were far quicker in obtaining information than the tools available in intelligence investigations. Donna consulted with an NSLU attorney, Susan, and according to Donna, Susan concurred with the matter that it should be handled as an intelligence investigation and that because of the wall, a criminal agent could not participate in the search for or any interviews of Khalid al Midar. When Donna advised Scott of Susan's opinion in an email message, Scott responded by email that he believed the wall was inapplicable. Scott ended his message by suggesting that because of the NSLU's position, people were going to die, and that he hoped the NSLU would stand by its position then. The way that FBI headquarters handled the Khalid Al-Midar information reflected its interpretation of the requirements of the wall prior to September 11th. First, because the predication of the search for Khalid Al-Midar originated from the NSA reports, 
This information could not be immediately shared with criminal agents. Instead, it first had to be cleared for dissemination by the NSA, which would determine whether the intelligence was based on FISA information. If so, the information had to be cleared for passage to the criminal agents. The information had to be provided to the NSLU, which then provided the information to OLIPR, which then provided it to the FISA court, which then had to be approved, and the passage of the information to criminal agents. In fact, the limited INS information concerning Khalid Ahmedars and Nawafa Hazmi's entries into the United States was the only unrestricted information in the electronic cable immediately available to the criminal investigators. As in the Zacharias Musawi case, the decision to open an intelligence investigation resulted in certain restrictions. FBI headquarters employees understood that they needed to ensure that they avoided any activities that the FISA court or OIPR could later deem too criminal, could use as a basis to deny a FISA application. This included preventing a criminal agent from participating in a subject interview in an intelligence investigation. While Scott was correct that the wall had been created to deal with the handling of only FISA information, that there was no legal barrier to a criminal agent being present for an interview with Khalid al if it occurred in the intelligence investigation, FBI headquarters and NSLU believed that the original wall had been extended by the FISA court and OIPR to cover such an interview. Scott's frustration over the wall was similar to Henry's in the Massawi investigation, Henry being Harry Samet. When Henry was told by Don that seeking prosecutor involvement prematurely could potentially harm any FISA request, Scott, like Henry, wanted to pursue a criminal investigation and became frustrated when he was advised by FBI headquarters that he could not proceed in the manner he deemed appropriate. Scott's perception was that FBI headquarters had misconstrued the wall and that the wall had been inappropriately expanded. He told the Office of the Inspector General that he believed the wall should only relate to FISA or FISA-derived information. Like Minneapolis FBI, Scott believed that he was being handcuffed in the performance of his job and that FBI headquarters erred on the side of caution in its approach to the intelligence information. FBI headquarters, on the other hand, acted in accordance with its experience with OIPR and the FISA court. FBI headquarters believed that OIPR and the FISA court required strict adherence to the procedures for the passage of intelligence information to criminal investigations and required separating criminal and intelligence information. Donna explained that the FISA court's mandates resulted in the need for the FBI to create a near complete separation between intelligence and criminal investigations in order to effectively use intelligence information. Rob also told the Office of the Inspector General that there were landmines in dealing with the intelligence versus criminal information, and it was difficult to appropriately straddle the two sides. Our review of this case here at the Office of the Inspector General showed that the wall had been expanded to create a system that was complex and had made it increasingly difficult to effectively use intelligence information within the FBI. The wall, or maze of walls, as one witness described it, significantly slowed the flow of intelligence information to criminal investigations. The unintended consequence of the war was to hamper the FBI's ability to conduct effective counterterrorism investigations because the FBI's efforts were sharply divided in two, and only one side had immediate and complete access to the available information. The war was not, however, the only impediment in the FBI's handling of the investigation to find Khalid Al-Midar and Nawafa Hasbi. We at the Office of the Inspector General found that there were also other problems in how the search for Al-Midar and Al-Hasbi were handled. 